Good morning. Good morning. Today is 17 March of the year 2019. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today, I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteers, Diane Thompson, and special guest, uh, Chauncey uh, Spencer II. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of hearing the story of Private Chauncey Spencer. Uh, Private Spencer was an instrument mechanic as well as, a repre as representing the Inspector General's office reporting at the Tuskegee Airfield in Alabama uh, conditions on the base. Uh, the private uh, passed away uh, in 2002, so his son, Chauncey II, uh, will be uh, relating his story uh, for us. Chauncey, really good to have you here. I wish your dad was here. This, this is a picture of my daughter, Jenny Spencer, mm -hmm. uh, and she was able to come with me to the grand opening of the Tuskegee Army Airfield, Moton Field, and this is the new sign in front of Moton Field in Tuskegee, Alabama. Oh, okay. All right. So it was called Moulton Field? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. At, at, uh, Moulton, Field, Moulton Field was the cadet side of the non-military. Oh, okay. When they went to Kennedy Field, then they went to the Army Air Base or Tuskegee Army Air Field. Okay. So Moulton Field was part of the property of Tuskegee Institute, later Tuskegee University. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can put that down now. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me move this up just a little bit here. Okay. okay, Chauncey, um first of all, would uh you please state and spell your father's full name? Yes, sir. My father's name is Chauncey, spelled C H A U N C E Y, middle name Edward, E D W A R D, last name Spencer, S P E N C E R, senior. Okay. And um uh, uh, where was he born? He was born in Lynchburg, Virginia. And what year, or what was the, the date that he was born? He was born November 5, 1906. So when he passed away, he was how old? He was 95. He was a little shy of his 96th birthday. He, he okay. died in August. And um, what was his father's name? My, fa uh, my father's father's name was Edward Alexander Spencer. And what did he do? He was a postman and he owned a grocery store. In Lynchburg? In Lynchburg, Virginia. Okay. And have you traced back his roots, uh, his, uh, that family on that side? I have. I can go back to 1743. I can go back to where we're related to the surname Spencer. Princess Diane is a distant cousin of ours, and oh. so is Churchill. Oh, really? Yes, okay. sir. So uh, were they slaves back in those days? Uh, yes. My, so the slavery side on my, on my grandfather, Edward Spencer, comes from Samuel Spencer. Uh, Samuel Spencer was the master. Uh, and he was related, he was a cousin of R.J. Reynolds, of the Reynolds Tobacco Company. Oh, okay. So was that in Virginia? That was in Virginia. Virginia. Okay. And um, did they talk about, or anybody in your family, how they were treated uh, by Mr. Spencer or anything like that back in those days? Uh, I can only go by what I got from my father. My father has traced the lineage back uh, mm -hmm. to where we have the papers that my relatives, uh, Basically, my great grandfather has listed his property along with the horses and the shovels. Uh, and at his death, he wrote in his will at his death that his wife would inherit all of his property, being the slaves, as long as she behaved herself. And was that a uh, uh, tobacco plantation, basically? That, that was tobacco. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I assume that uh, in 1865, or that they became free. Uh, Free people. They yeah. After Emancipation Proclamation. Well, yeah, yeah, sixty-three or sixty-four. I'm guessing, and I'm I'm dangerous, but I'm going to say sixty-five. Okay. I'm going to say from sixty-three to sixty-five. Somewhere about that. Well, it was uh, the Gettysburg Address. I think that Lincoln. I think he talked about that a lot at that point. Thank okay. you. Um, and uh, your father's mother. Uh, what was her name and her maiden name? My father's mother's name was Anna, and so that's I'm sorry, Ann. A-N-N-E, Bethel, uh, 
Scales. I had a blank. <laughs> Scales, okay. Yes. And do you know anything about her um, background? Yes. Uh, so she comes from uh, a slave side as well. Her mother uh, was a concubine, Sarah Scales. Uh, and she was uh, uh, living in West Virginia. They lived in uh, Bluefield, West Virginia. And uh, West Virginia at that time was a non-slave state. That's where they divided Virginia from West Virginia. So there was a dentist, I'm sorry, there was a barber by the name of Dickerson. And my grandmother's mother and my grandmother's father separated. And so my grandmother, Ann Spencer, uh, left with her mother and they went to West Virginia where they were cared for by a barber by the name of Dickerson. And at that time, barbers in that culture was a very prominent position because the barbers did surgery and other things yeah, exactly. as well. Was, was he a black man or a no. white man? Yes, he, he, was, he was a black man. He was black man. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, so she grew up in West Virginia. She, gr she grew up in West Virginia and uh, that's where she learned how to read because she befriended one of her friends who happened to be white who was the only one that could go into the stores and buy these magazines because we weren't allowed to read. Mm -hmm. And so all the softback magazines, my grandmother learned how to read from secondhand, passed off from her friend oh. to her. <laughs> okay. Um, did your dad have any brothers and sisters? He did. My father had two sisters, uh, Elroy uh, and Teen. And so Elroy and Teen both had uh, scholarships to go to the University of Virginia, but it was a segregated university. They didn't allow blacks in there. So they paid for one of my aunts to go to Fisk University and the other to go to Hunter College in New York. Um, uh, are they still alive? No, they're not. Okay. So he just had two sisters. He just had two sisters. It was just three of them. He was the only son of Anna and Edward Spencer. Okay. Now Lynchburg, um, where is Lynchburg? In Lynchburg is in the center or the central part of Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, about 180 miles uh, south of Washington, D.C. And what was the population the time that your dad was growing up? Any I'm idea? guessing. I'm probably guessing, and I really don't know, so maybe I shouldn't answer that. I don't know. Okay. Um, and uh, where did your dad uh, go to school? My father went to school. He went through elementary school, through all segregated schools, of course. Uh, he went through high school. He went to Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, uh, where his mother was a librarian, Ann Spencer. Uh, and at his graduation, the white school was E.C. Glass, which was on the other side of the town. And they let their students out 15 minutes earlier than they let the African Americans out of their school. So my father boycotted that, and when the white students were dismissed, so was he. He left. And so they said, well, if we're doing that, we're not going to give you a diploma. <laughs> so my grandmother gave him a hard time about that, but when he con continued on his education, he went to Virginia Seminary College and received a bachelor's degree in sociology. Uh, at that time, he was able to get the 15 minutes to his graduation. <laughs> uh, and did he play sports in high school? He did. He played football. Did he? he played football and track. Uh, and the Valuable Player Award, which was one of his old leather helmets that they wore back in that day, yeah. uh, still sits in the glass at Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. <laughs> what were their colors? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't know. And do, do, what position did he play? Did he, he was know? a halfback. Oh, okay. Pretty fast. Then, he was huh? pretty fast. You say he ran track too? He ran track as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, did he have any special girlfriends in high school that you know of? Uh, Elvira Jackson, who was his high school sweetheart, who he married uh, and divorced, uh, would be the only person I know. And I only learned that from reading his autobiography <laughs> in 1975 that my father was married before. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so when he gra what year did he graduate then? He graduates uh, in 1926. And you say he went to Virginia? Seminary College. Seminarian? Seminary College. Seminary. To be a... Uh, to be a uh, uh, well, uh, to be a social worker is well. what he ended up being. Uh, so he graduates from college in 1926. And that's a black uh, college? That was, everything was segregated. We're talking segregation all the way up through 1955. And where was that again? That was in Lynchburg, Virginia. That was also in Lynchburg. That's the oldest college in the state of Virginia. Really? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and so did he go four years there then? He went four years and received his bachelor's. Okay. And uh, what did he do? What, he graduated what year then? 1926. From college. From college? Yeah. Okay. And what did he do then? Then he applied and became a social worker 
uh, and he worked as a social worker and he was discouraged because he saw people that needed the social service help weren't able to get it because of lack of education and other, uh, other areas that they weren't able to be acknowledged and he felt that it was unfair and he continued to wish to fly because I have to back you up. So at the age of 11 years old, he spots his first airplane flying over the skies of Lynchburg, Virginia. And his mother says his nickname was Woogie. So his mother says, Woogie, Woogie, look up. And Woogie looked up and saw his first airplane flying over the skies of Lynchburg and the aviation bug bit him. So at the age of 16, his father, Edward Spencer, said, come on, I'm gonna take you out to the airport. We're gonna get you uh, aviation. We're gonna get you uh, instructions on flying. And he goes out to the airport where he says the manager at the airport wouldn't even raise his head. So we don't teach color to fly. They don't have the intelligence. So this is when he wants to become a pilot even more so. He doesn't give up the dream. So he continues on uh, to where he becomes a pilot. But I wanted to back you in there. There, there was yeah. a wish. And so what happens is Oscar the priest. So Oscar the priest comes to my father's, my grandmother and grandfather's house. Oscar the priest is the first African-American congressman after Reconstruction out of Illinois. He was a Republican uh, because he was part of, uh, of Roosevelt, um, I'm sorry, he was part of Lincoln's team. And uh, he was there along with Vernon Johns. The Reverend Vernon Johns' daughter is the one of the five cases, the Brown versus the school board. And they lived in Farmville, Virginia. So they were there. And my father was walking through the sunroom there. They had a Queen Anne home that my father grew up in and walking through the sunroom. And so uh, Oscar the priest says, Ed, is that your son? And so Edward Spencer says, yeah, that's my son. He said, well, what's he doing? He said, well, he's a social worker, but he wants to fly. And so Oscar the priest says, well, hell, send him out to Chicago. They got a group out in Chicago, Cornelius Coffee, Dale White, Willa Brown. They're doing a hell of a job. And so my father then is invited to come out and speak with Oscar the priest. So he resigns his position as a social worker. His father gives him $900 and sends him to Chicago. Okay. By the way, when he was a social worker, was he working just with black people or white people? Or, or All both? people. All people. All people that, that met the poverty line. I, I see. Yes. In Lynchburg. In Lynchburg, Virginia. Okay. Yes, sir. So he went, went to, what year did he go to Chicago then? He went to Chicago the uh, uh, latter part of 32, the beginning of 33. And so did he take flying lessons? When he he got did. There? He gets there, and it's an interesting story on that. So he gets there, so there's a John C. Robinson. John C. Robinson is the pilot that ended up going to Ethiopia and training Haley Selassie's people on how to fly after Mussolini took over Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So John Robinson and Cornelius Coffee were best friends. Cornelius Coffee opened up the Coffee School of Aviation in Chicago. He came from Arkansas. And John Robinson came from Gulfport, Mississippi. And they became friends and they became auto mechanics. And they trained in Detroit. And they opened up business in, at Mac Chevrolet. They were the first two blacks hired at Mac Chevrolet in Chicago. And they were both master mechanics. Uh, and so Coffee stays in Chicago and Robinson, as I said, goes to Ethiopia. So Coffee is the person that's there. Uh, John Robinson hasn't left yet, so he's in his garage, and my father is sent over to John Robinson's garage with his $900. And my father said, Pop, he calls me Pop, he said, Pop, he said, I didn't see anything in there that resembled aviation, but Johnny really wanted that $900, but I wouldn't let it go. <laughs> so then he leaves there and he goes to Earl Renfro. Dr. Earl Renfro is Dennis and one of the first African-American flight instructors. And he has this little office, and in the corner, there's a uh, mechanic working on a radio engine by the name of Dale Lawrence White, who ends up being my father's best friend. And he says, hey, he said, what you doing? He said, I'm working on an aviation engine. And so Chauncey Spencer Sr. says, well, I want to learn how to fly. He said, well, hey, stick around, and I'll take you out to the airfield at 87th Street and Harlem Avenue and let you meet Cornelius Coffee." So that's how the door opened oh. for my father's opportunity. Oh. <laughs> did flying come easy to him? It did. It did coffee, as I said, and I met coffee. I got to meet some of the people I'm telling you about. Yeah. And so I met coffee in 1985 in Chicago. Mm. And coffee said, your father was a natural. All I did was stuck him in an airplane and told him, you'll learn how to fly. Just keep going up and down the field. And when it goes up in the air, you're flying. And so my <laughs> father said, basically, that's how I learned, just from trial and error. When I felt brave enough, I pulled back on the stick and the plane went up. <laughs> Do you remember what uh, plane his, he first flew? Uh, I don't, but I have a picture of it. Oh, okay. I do not know what kind of plane yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 
Then he got his did he got a pilot's license? He and, gets his he gets his student pilot license. He never he never uh, went back and got his pilot license, but he flew enough time to get one. They've always asked my father, why did you get a pilot license? He said, I don't know. I had a lot of things to do. So then when he finishes that, but he has two pilot licenses. So he had the student pilot license uh, from Chicago, and mm -hmm. then he gets a pilot license later on in Ohio, where he rents airplanes and flies around on the weekends. Oh, okay. And in the meantime, does he have a job? Uh, yes, he's working for WPA. Work Progress Administration. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so he's working there under work relief and he's assigned to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, he's, he's assigned to, oh my God, my mind went blank. He's assigned to Horace Caton, thank you. He's assigned to Horace Caton and Horace Caton is, is in, in charge of the back, Black Riders uh, assignment to go out and interview slaves. Interesting you asked me that question. So my father has actually written, I have a book that hasn't been published on his uh, interviewing slaves yeah. and how they were treated before, before the Civil War ended. Huh. And so their job was to go all around the country and interview black people that were slaved. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Wow, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you, you're, you, you're compiling a book about all that? My father has the book. I just haven't released it to a publisher yet. Oh, okay. But it was written in 1944. Did he write your dad? My write? dad wrote it, he and did. it's on that old tissue paper with one of those typewriters that you have to slam, slam, slam. Okay. And so I've turned it. I've, I have the original, but I've changed it to a paper so it doesn't destroy it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So how long did he do that? And then he kind of went all over the country. And he did. So his life is so who, very. Who's, who's paying to have this done? Uh, at the time when he's flying. So there's a, several things that happen. So before I mix up my own interview. Uh, my father did several things. So when he flies to Washington, they're sponsored by uh, the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier uh, and the National Airmen's Association of America, which is their association. Uh, the main part of the money came for their flight. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather gave them $1,000 to rent an airplane from Art Latour for $500, which I do know what kind of airplane that was. It was a Lincoln Page biplane, had an altimeter and oil pressure gauge, and it had a drag tail. And so $500 goes there. My father and Dale take $100 a piece and buy new flight gear, so that leaves them $300. Now they don't have enough money for the fuel for this airplane to make this cross-country flight. So my father worked as an escort uh, in Chicago for the movers and shakers. Uh, and so Ed and George Jones were the policy writers. They were the number men. And so sometimes Ed or George would be out of town and his wife would need to be escorted to a bingo game or something like that. And my father would escort them to a bingo game. So he got to know the, the movers and shakers on the south side of Chicago. And so Queenie Davis tells my father, listen, you need some money. Go talk to Ed and George Jones. They know you. They'll help you. And so they made arrangements to meet with Ed and George Jones on 47th Street in Chicago, which was a Ben Franklin store. And in the back of the Friend Franklin store was a number racket. So they go there and they go back in the back of the store and Ed says, hey, Chauncey, what's going on? And so Chauncey's supposed to be able to want to tell them we need some money to take this cross country trip. But the depression is still active. So how are you going to ask a man for fifty dollars when you when you you know everybody's starving? And so Dale White's there, uh, Willa Brown is there, and so Dale says, "Tell him, Johnsey, tell him." And so he says, "Well, we have three hundred dollars, and we need about two hundred and fifty dollars to make this flight." And Ed looks over at his secretary and says, "Right, Johnsey, check for a thousand dollars." So now they have thirteen hundred dollars, and so they start on their trip. And the trip they take off on May the eighth of nineteen thirty nine from Chicago, flying to Washington on their way to the historically black colleges in the South. And their first stop was supposed to be Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, and that was supposed to be West Virginia State College. Uh, the president there was President Davis. And he was waiting to greet the pilots there to encourage the young students to get involved in the civil pilot training program. And they, on their way there, they had an emergency and the crankshaft went bad on the plane over Sherwood, Ohio, and they had to make an emergency landing behind a farmer's farm, behind a farmer's barn. <laughs> and uh, they landed there. And my father tells uh, the story and he says, if it wasn't for Dale, we wouldn't have made it because Dale was the more, expense, more experienced pilot. And so he said, he was, Chauncey Sr. was trained that when you have a problem, you circle around and circle around until you find a place that's safe to land. Well, Dale didn't do that. Dale 
uh, side slipped the plane down to about 40 feet and pancake landed the plane right behind a barber's farm, uh, behind the farmer's barn. And the farmer, uh, my father jumped out of the plane. He was in the front, Dale was in the back. My father got out of the plane first and the barn door opened and the farmer's name was Mr. Miller. And Mr. Miller opened the door and my father said, as in a joking manner, he says that Mr. Miller looked at them like they were invaders from Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, only jokingly, he said the farmer uh, was so excited that he said, stay here, stay here. So Dale thought they were going to get some people to harm them. So he said, we got to get out of here, but we can't get out of here. And so my father said, just stay calm, just stay calm. And what he did is he ran to get his father-in-law, who was a pilot during World War I, oh. and he loved pilots. And he had never seen colored pilots. And so here they see their first two <laughs> colored pilots. <laughs> and so they continue on after, after they rebuild the engine in two days and one night. Coffee drives down from Chicago. They rebuild the engine and they take off and on, now they're on their way to Morgantown, West Virginia. They stay in Morgantown, West Virginia to speak with the students, but it's getting windy and the airport is under construction. So the manager says, we can't let you stay here, but you can make it to Pittsburgh. It's only 50 miles. Well, my father didn't have any choice and they take off and my father says somebody turned on the black light. No lights on the plane. And so... Normally, you gun the engine in succession over the tower, and the light comes on because we have no radio control on this plane. And nothing happened. They said they did it about 16 times, and Chauncey Spencer was in control of the, uh, the plane at that time. And he looked over, over to the left, and he saw a passenger plane coming in. And he signaled back to Dale, hands up, you take over, and Dale, hands no. And so Chauncey gets about eight blocks behind this commercial plane, and when this commercial plane comes into the tower, the lights come on because he's on radio. And now they can see the field. And when the commercial plane landed, my father landed about eight blocks right behind him and ground looped the airplane. Oh, yeah. The sirens came on. The CAA was called out. And Inspector Golf came to the hearing. Well, they had to have representation, so they went to the Pittsburgh Courier. Robert Van, the founder, he was a practicing attorney. He had contacted the manager in West Virginia. They said it was true. And so he, he, he represented them in their hearing, and they were excused. But they were warned uh, by Inspector Goff that if you would fly, if we hear about you flying within 500 miles of a commercial airplane, you'll be grounded for a lifetime. They were fine with that, and later on they became close friends. Robert Van gave them $500 and a letter of contact in Washington. They continue on to Washington. When they get to Washington, they land at National. Edgar Brown is their contact. And Edgar Brown is a part of the National Airmen's Association, but he's working out of Washington as a lobbyist. And he meets them out there, and he brings them into the congressional building through the little electric car. And they come there, and there's a senator standing there waiting to get on the electric car going out to the airport. He says, good morning, Edgar. Who are your two friends here? And so Edgar Brown says, they're trying to get into the Army Air Corps. And so the senator's name is Harry S. Truman. And Senator Truman says, uh, are they citizens? And so Chauncey Spencer Sr. says, yes, we're citizens. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you vote? Yes, we vote. Uh, do you work? Yes. Well, why aren't you working today? Well, we thought it was important to show the, the, uh, the, the importance of, of the inclusion of African Americans in the Army Air Corps, and we wanted to show that we are capable of flying. And so he said, where's your airplane? And so they said it's out at National. So, he, so Truman looks over at Edgar and he said, Edgar, how about if I come out and take a look at your friend's airplane around 3 o'clock? And so Edgar said, what do you think, fellas? And both the pilots said, yes, fine with us. And so my father said, Pop, we got out there at 315 because we didn't think they were coming anyway. And he gets out there at 315 and Harry Truman is standing there on a little milk crate looking down in this cockpit and four administrative assistants around him. And they said, you mean to tell me you flew this thing I'm looking at from Chicago to Washington? And so Chauncey Spencer Sr. said, Says, yes, we did, sir. Can we take you for a flight? And Senator Truman says, no, you can't take me for a flight. But if you got guts enough to fly this thing I'm looking at from Chicago to Washington, I got guts enough to find out why you can't become part of the United States Army Air Corps. So he joined in the teams with Eleanor Roosevelt, who was being encouraged by Mary McLeod Bethune to include the Negro into the civil pilot training program. And it did happen. And that would have been... That what? would have all been in 1939, so we have to go back a little bit. So there are two contacts that Chauncey Spencer and Dale White had from Illinois was James Slattery, a Democratic a senator, and Everett Dirksen, a Republican, who moved that to the House that the Civil Pilot Training Program would go active in April of 1939, but it did not include African Americans. But it had not been signed by President Roosevelt, which made everything possible, because when they finally signed it in June of 1939, at that time, all Americans were included into that program. Okay. Yeah. So did they, um, 
uh, is that when they joined the uh, or did he joined the Air Corps then? Or, or? No, he was still a civilian fighting for us to be in there because we were not part of the Air Corps. No there was no blacks in the Air Corps, period. There was no blacks in the Air Corps until 1941 when B.O. Davis, that first group, 42C. Right. Yeah. And, and how did that come about? So that comes about. So what happens is after that, they, uh, they encourage the black college to get involved. So Hampton, Howard, uh, Tuskegee, uh, West Virginia State College, North Carolina A&T, uh, Delaware State, I think I said that. Uh, so those five colleges and one non-university, Coffee School of Aviation, they appropriated $3.5 million to include the Negro into the Army Air Corps by way of the Civil Pilot Training Program. And by the time that we needed pilots after they attacked Pearl Harbor, we then get involved into the theater uh, along with Churchill. At that time, everything, we're, we're just building our Air Force. We, America really didn't have a strong Air Force. We depended on uh, the Europeans and the British to supply us with planes, uh, uh, the Spitfire and things like that because we didn't have that technology at that time. Did your dad ever talk about um, after uh, September 1939 when the war started in Europe yes. about whether he felt we would eventually get into that? He did, and they knew that, and that's, they knew that it was just a matter of time that all Americans would have to come from. Yeah. We'd need all of us. And so they knew that, and they were fighting against the ignorance of racism and Jim Crow in the South and racism across America, but that didn't let them stop. That didn't stop them because they're patriotics. They're, they were patriotic to the need. They knew that sooner or later, with the bombers going out there with 10 men and a bomber, we're losing 50 bombers a day. We're losing 500 men a day. We, after a while, we were going to be eliminated from the war because we wouldn't have enough manpower. Uh, did he ever talk about what he was doing December 7th, 1941? I can't, I can't, I can't quote on that. Okay. So when did he actually uh, uh, join the Army? He joined the Army in August of 1940. Okay. And so what was he doing? Uh, he went through basic, he went to Fort Custer, Michigan. Uh, he was an artillery. Artillery. Was was he uh, married? At this he was time? not. He was not married. Still not married. No, okay. he was not married. Okay. So he went to artillery. I'm, I apologize. I'm, I'm sorry. Strike that. He did. He got married before he went in. He gets married on August the 18th, and that's why. Well, we weren't recording this, but Colonel Pitts tells him, "You stay out until March of '41, and then you come in because you just got married." And so. He's, he's in the military, but he's not to report until the following And few was months. that his high school sweetheart that he married? No, he yeah. marries my mother, so. Oh, your mom. Okay. My mother, so my mother is uh, high school, in high school, 16 years younger than my father, just graduated from the Sabo High School in 1940. Okay, what, and what was, well, we talked about her. Uh, she grew up in West Virginia? Is no, my mother, we haven't talked mom. about. Okay, we haven't talked about your mom, okay. Oh yeah, okay, what was her name and her maiden name? My mother's maiden name was Anna, A-N-N-A, May uh, Howard. Okay, and where did she grow up? She grew up in Chicago, that's where they met. So okay. she was born in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, my grandmother, her mother was raped by a white man in, in Lexington, Kentucky, and they were gonna try to kill my mother. And so they had to get my mother out of Lexington. And so my grandmother went first and found safe haven in Chicago and married a man and had a home for my mother. And then they went back when my mother was four years old. They, they finally got her out of Kentucky and she grew up in Chicago. And she graduated in the first class 1940 with John Johnson from Johnson Publications. Those were some of the people that were graduates of hers uh, from DeSalvo uh, High School there in Chicago. And how did they meet? Your they, mom and dad? they met. So after my father's flight, he uh, and I didn't tell you the rest of the flight. So after they leave Washington, they go to New York, where they're meeting with with Mayor LaGuardia at the time. And Mayor LaGuardia uh, is there, and Miss Bojangles, Bill Bojangles' wife. They land at Floyd Bennett Airport in New York, and it's Joe Lewis's 25th birthday. So they celebrate Joe Lewis's birthday. They have a parade for Dale and Chauncey uh, down on Harlem. They go to the Cotton Club. They celebrate at the Cotton Club. It's the first time that they actually allowed African Americans to be patrons and not service at the Cotton Club. Though people didn't realize that those nightclubs, you thought that they were all black nightclubs, but blacks were not allowed to attend those nightclubs. They were just allowed to work in those nightclubs. <laughs> so he met her there? Or? So no, so I'm sorry. So he meets, so then he comes back to Chicago 
And there's another part of the story, if I can do it, and you can edit sure. me out. Yeah. So, so after they leave New York, my father tells Dale about his experience when he was 16 years old in Virginia. And he says, Dale, he says, listen, we're flying over the pattern of Virginia going back to Chicago. Would you mind if we landed at that same airport? Was, was uh, Preston, uh, what's the name of that hotel? Uh, uh, Preston, oh my God, I have to think about the name of the hotel, and I know the name of the airport. Preston Glen Hotel, Preston Glen Airport. I can't think of the name of it right now. I'm sorry, and I really want to know it. Uh, but they land at the same airport where my father was told that they didn't teach oh. color to fly. <laughs> and so he telegrammed my grandmother, and my grandmother let all the students out from the segregated black high school to see these first black pilots, and one of them was hometown. And so they landed in the same airport 16 years later where they said they didn't teach black to fly because they didn't have the uh, intelligence to do so. And so after they leave there, uh, my grandmother receives a telegram from Robert Abbott from the Chicago Defender saying that your son's trip was more uh, successful than he realized because they've appropriated $3.5 million to include the Negro into the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're reading the paper there at the same airport where they were not supposed to be landing because they weren't smart enough to fly. <laughs> and so after that, they leave. They come back to Chicago where they have a welcome back party for them. And at the dance they had at night, my mother and father met, but my father was way, was much older than my mother. And my mother's father didn't like that idea, Clyde Howard. He didn't like that idea. But they were both enthusiasts and they were both part of the National Airmen's Association of America. And so uh, my father said that he asked my mother to dance. And my mother says, I'm tired now. But then my father said he would look around and she'd be dancing with somebody else. So he said that was going to be his goal. He told her, he, he says, Pop, I told your mother, I'm going to marry you. And my mother says, sure. <laughs> and so uh, this all happened in 39. So my mother graduates in 1940. And so August of 15, she turns 18 years old. And August of 18th, they get married uh, downtown the city of Chicago. And her father, what did he do? My, my, uh, he, was, he was a mechanic. He was a mechanic, uh, uh, and he was a pipe fitter. Uh, worked for the city of Chicago, and on the side he had a mechanic shop, and he worked on some of Al Capone's cars. Oh, really? <laughs> my mother used to drive them. Is that right? <laughs> okay, so, okay, so he's done um, uh, basic training at Fort... Uh, Fort Custer. And yeah. the name of that airport is Preston Glen. Oh, okay. Preston Glen Airport in Lynchburg, Virginia still there? It's still there, uh, but it's named Lynchburg Airport. Oh. But that same property is exactly still there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what did he do after he got a basic training then? After he gets out of basic training, then he's notified that he's too old to go into active duty. Uh, so they saw that he applied as an instrument mechanic, along with Dale who applied as a mechanic. And so Dale went on and worked. Dale, Dale White was the first African-American hired at Wright-Patterson to be a mechanic. And he stayed there for 40 years. And he opened up an uh, aviation program at Wilberforce and also Central Ohio. Um, so my father then is notified. Uh, first he thinks he's coming home. So he says, he quotes Martin Luther King, free at last, free at last, I'm out the Army. <laughs> and so he comes home to Lynchburg where my mother's waiting for him. They're newly married. And, he's, uh, and my mother's staying at his parents' home. And he gets a telegram to report to Wright-Patterson Field, uh, Air Material Command. And so his application is pulled, and they bring him in on civilian side, and they bring him in as a junior instrument mechanic. And about maybe about two months or four months later, he becomes advanced in that training. He becomes the senior instrument mechanic, but he meets discrimination there. And so they find out that there's a problem down in Tuskegee, and they need somebody to go down there and pose as, uh, as a legitimate bringing back information. And so they see my father's having problems. They, they can't uh, stand a boycott. We're just getting into the war. We need these instrument mechanics. And so they, uh, this is when uh, Colonel Esther Brooks calls my father in the office and said, listen, we have another assignment. We'd like for you to consider it. And so think about it and let us know on Monday. So this is Friday. And so Monday came. He says, have you thought about it? And he says, yes. He says, well, uh, we need you to get on this right away. My father says, well, I really don't think I have much of a choice. He said, well, you do have a choice. We can bring you back, waive your age, and bring you back in this active duty and put you on the ground, or you can take this assignment. So my father felt like we're going to take that assignment. And so the assignment is Executive Order 8802, non-discrimination, that Roosevelt comes out with. And he's sent down under that plan 
posing as an instrument mechanic, May of 1942, he's sent down there. My mother's newly married, and she doesn't want to stay in Ohio at that time. They're living in Dayton, or actually they're living in Yellow Springs. And so my mother uh, has been given permission to come with him. And so he goes down, she goes down to Tuskegee with my father in 1942. Uh, meanwhile, my mother takes a leave of absence. She's a procurement officer for the Air Force. And she's working there at, at, at Wright-Patterson. And there's three areas there, area A, B, and C. Administration is where my mother worked at. C is where they made the planes. And experimental was in area B. Uh, and so my mother continued to work there. But when they, when they were assigned to come to Tuskegee, then she leaves, goes with my father to Tuskegee. Uh, B.O. Davis and them uh, had just left. So they leave March of 1942. So we have two more classes coming after that. So they had left to go overseas? No, they are not left. They had just they just qualified to be pilots. Oh, I see. They don't go overseas. Well, actually, uh, one unit does. So the first unit, and I don't want to cross myself with this interview, but they haven't gone overseas. Okay. And so uh, my father uh, meets a lot of headwind there in Tuskegee, both black and white, hmm. uh, because the uh, uh, provost marshal was black. They, went, they, they sent him out there to find out who the Spencer guy is. You know, he's riding around in a new Buick, and we want to know who he is. And he's got some white woman riding around with him. That's my mother. Oh. And so, uh, so they pull him over, and they arrest him, and they try to interrogate him, and they can't get any information. They said, we don't see any information on you. We don't see where your transfer papers came from. And my father says, well, you have to contact the inspector general's office. And that's all I can tell you. So my father was transferred to Tuskegee not through uh, Montgomery, but through Mobile. He comes in through Mobile, Alabama. I can show you. So that's why nobody knew who he was, because he was posing as a cover, and they didn't want anybody to leak that out, and he'd get lynched while he's down there in Alabama. And so uh, he's arrested, he's released, uh, and then he's told to go out and, speak, and sweep the hangar. So my father says, I'm an instrument mechanic, I'm not a janitor. And so they say, you're in the South, and you're an in, and this is what you do out here. Or you can get back to the same gate you came in and exit. And so... He refuses to sweep the floor, so they charge him in his subordination. They freeze his pay. They go after him again. Uh, he's then uh, exonerated of all the suspension. His back pay is given back to him, but he's too hot now. So now they got to bring him back to Wright-Patterson because things are getting dangerous. By that time, we're in July. He's already reported enough information for them to get rid of Colonel Kimball and Captain William G. Williams and bring in Noel Parrish and then promote B.O. Davis as a captain. The two guys they got rid of, were they white or black? They were white. Okay. They were white. And one of them was from Boston, and he says, I'm going to make a career out of the Army Air Corps, and this is what we do in the South, and this is what I plan on doing. So in other words, if you don't like it in the South, mm -hmm. go north. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they were replaced by they two were black replaced guys? By, no, they were replaced by, so Noah Parrish, Noah Parrish, uh, was a colonel, he's and later a general. So Noah Parrish ended up being the commander of the Tuskegee Airmen. He came from Kentucky, he was white. Okay. And Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr., of course, was black. Right. And because he graduated from West Point, he was a captain. I mean, and so, mm -hmm. and so he was, and so after he went to Fort Riley, they, they failed him. And he went back down to Montgomery, where they passed him, because he faced the same discrimination. But because his father was the first African-American general, they couldn't push him around as much as they could push around other people. And they couldn't push my father around because he had the attorney general behind him. <laughs> yeah. Who was the attorney general? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said attorney general. Pardon. The inspector general. Do you know his name? I, I want to say, I do not know. I want to say okay. Stenson, but I may be wrong. Okay. All right. So he was down there about six months or so? Yes, in Tuskegee. Yeah, okay. And uh, so then he... They both went back to... Uh, then they both came back to Wright-Patterson, yeah. where my father then was assigned to integrate the civilian side of the Army Air Corps, because it doesn't become the Air Force until 1948. And so he did. He brought 9,000 blacks in management and director jobs over whites. Mm -hmm. So Joe Watts, who was the uh, director of personnel on the civilian side, who was my father's boss, called him down to the Pentagon to have him drag his feet on integration. And my father told him he wasn't going to drag his feet on integration. They had some choice men words. And my father got on a plane and came back to Wright-Patterson, where the next day he was arrested and charged as security risk with 19 charges under McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. And that happened. He stayed uh, with no pay, with no citizenship for a year and a half, and was exonerated of all charges. Uh, and this happens around the end of 1952, the beginning of 53.
And after that, at this time, he's a GS-13. His next promotion is to go in front of Congress to be promoted to be the director of personnel at Sherboat France. So he's supposed to go to Sherboat France, but he stepped on some congressmen and pulled them up on the, on the, on the carpet. Uh, and so when he did that, they still were in position, and they canceled that move. And then they said, well, we only have another position, and it's at Norton Air Force Base, it's in the GS-9, public relations. And so my father, due to the hostile environment, he chose that to be the better move. And so uh, he leaves Wright-Patterson, and my mother resigns her position. She never did go back to the Air Force, resigned her position. And then they come to San Bernardino uh, in 1956 when I'm three months old. So in June of 1956, they come to San Bernardino where my father uh, retires from the Air Force in October of 1960. Uh, and that's when he finished. Well, he doesn't finish with the Air Force there but he finishes with his official position because he became friends with a lot of the colonels. And one of the colonels owned uh, the restaurant at Faba, up here in Rubida, at the, the airport there. And uh -huh. they owned the restaurant. And so my mother and father rented that restaurant from them and they turned it into Spencer Steakhouse. Oh, really? Yeah. And the Spencer Steakhouse? It's is right there in the center of that airport right now. Okay. It's, and it's got, a, in the, it's got a barbecue pit inside. It's all rock, yeah. if you've ever been in there. And so my father used to have a parachute draped on the ceiling all the way across the inside of that building. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the colonel had that place and they rented it from, from him. Okay. Uh, they're from right back, no, I'm sorry, from uh, Norton Air Force Base. So, so had they been into, in the restaurant business or any? They were, they started a restaurant business in Ohio. Like I said, my father's life is long. So Parker uh, drive in restaurants in Ohio. And so they had a franchise with Parkers. They were the first African Americans to have a franchise with Parkers. So they were in the restaurant business on the side because my father did a lot of entertaining uh, when he worked for the Inspector General's office. And so uh, nobody less than a, than a light lieutenant, I, I'm sorry, nobody less than a light colonel would be at their affairs. It was all rank status. You know, if you weren't a colonel, your wife wasn't, wasn't with a colonel, then it didn't happen. You already know how that works. And so he entertained people of high ranks, a lot of generals, General Hunter, uh, many generals that I can just call out. They were very active in mm -hmm. World War II. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, did a lot of public relations. And he did a lot of uh, uh, fixing of, of, of relationships, and they were done in his home uh, and things like that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, where um, uh, and you grew up, obviously, there in San Bernardino. I think you were 16, you were mentioning. Where did you guys live at that time? In San Bernardino, we lived at 752 North 8th Street okay. in San Bernardino, which is downtown. Uh, the home has been knocked down, and they've built a new home there. But uh, the Rileys, uh, he was the city manager. Mr. Riley was the city manager, so my father and mother didn't sell that house. They leased that house to them. They became city managers in San Bernardino, and my mother and father bought a home in Highland Park. And so the Rileys stayed there, and it ended, it ended up being in the Sun Times, uh, or the Sun Telegram, the paper there in San Bernardino, mm -hmm. uh, as the uniqueness of the house, because the house had a lot of history. They buy the house in San Bernardino, and they meet racism. So they tell them, uh, they find out, well, first my mother comes, and she looks at the house, so they think she's white. So, oh, great. So then my grandfather comes down to sign off on the house, and he looks black. And so all of a sudden, the for sale sign changes. Oh, well, you know, we have to bring an inspector in here first. All the walls have to be gutted. The floors have to be gutted. Thinking that that would deter my parents from doing it. No. They dug deep in those pockets, and they did it all. They changed everything in there, changed the plaster walls, ceilings, and they brought everything up to code. And uh, they stayed in that home. On their 30th anniversary, on my mother and father's 30th anniversary, Governor Jerry Brown, uh, John Quimby, other people that were movers and shakers in, in California attended uh, their uh, anniversary party uh, there. And it was all done Hawaiian style with the lights and the flowers, and it was beautiful. I, I remember that yeah. uh, at that time. Yeah. Uh, so um, where did you, where'd you go to school then? I, went, I started school at Harding Elementary School in San Bernardino. And then I went to Curtis Junior High School in San Bernardino, and then I graduated from Highland Park High School in Michigan. And then I went on to college, and I graduated from General Motors Institute Technology, GMI, uh, in Flint, Michigan. And then I did my internship at Chevrolet Engineering in Warren, Michigan. Okay. Um, did you, do you have any brothers and sisters? I do. There's eight of us. Eight of you. Yep. So, there's, so there's, uh, I have three brothers and four sisters. Okay. And uh, so we're going to start out. So my oldest brother is Edward Spencer. He's passed away. 
Uh, my next brother is Michael Spencer. He's still alive. He takes care of my mother in Virginia. Uh, and myself, Chauncey Spencer. And then my baby brother, uh, he died of suicide. Uh, Joel Spencer, he served in the Marines. Uh, and then on my sister's side, we have my older sister, Carol. She died of cancer. Uh, my next sister, Luan, she's still alive and has uh, two girls and a daughter. And they're all college graduates. Where in, do they live? In Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, my youngest sister, uh, Sean, well, not my youngest sister, after that is Sean, and Sean lives in Washington, D.C. She's an interior decorator. And then my youngest sister died of MS, and her name was Kyle. Oh. So out of eight of us, there's four of us alive. Are all of you more or less the same complexion that you are? Uh, we're not. We're not. Some are the first, the, some are lighter than me. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so. And what prompted the move to Highland Park in Michigan? The Highland Park, Michigan was when my father was asked when, when uh, some of the invitees were uh, uh, executives in, in, in politics in Detroit had come to the anniversary party because Chuck Seymour, uh, who's from San Bernardino, he was with John Lewis and John Lewis was part of the, the AFL-CIO. And so they were union guys. And so there was a lot of union involved with the Teamsters in Detroit. And my father worked with a lot of the union makers uh, to make things possible to allow blacks to get into those shops, uh, like the Gills that Reagan was in charge of, and it was, it was racist at that time, and uh, uh, the Carpenter Unions and any other union. We could not get in. And when I say we, we as a group of people, we could not get in because of the color of our skin or where we came from. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, how we get to, and I'm going around this question, so how we get to Highland Park is that uh, they saw my father's background and they saw what he had done in San Bernardino where he fought against the Black Panthers, he fought against the John Birchers, he fought against anybody that was against America. And he was not a real popular person, but he had a lot of guts and they knew that if he came to Detroit, he would have a real battle. And so he took it on and we ended up leaving. Uh, another reason we left there, my father tells me later, is because of safety factors. After the watch riots, my father was the first black police commissioner. So there's a lot of my father. My father was the San Bernardino sheriff. My father was the police commissioner in San Bernardino. My father was the president of the NAACP in San Bernardino. And so he was known by some and disliked by many. And so they, they firebombed our house at 752 North 8th Street. The Black Panthers did. They threw a bomb in there and said, you Uncle Tom, you pig. And so we went through all that. So we're little kids at that time. We, we don't really know what's going on. We just know it's dangerous, and we can't sit in the chair. We can't sit in front of a window. We know that. And so we go to Highland Park, Michigan. And we get to Highland Park, Michigan. I see discrimination in reverse. I see I go to a high school that's 25 percent. I'm sorry, there's, there's only 25 whites in this whole school, and it's predominantly black. And But because I'm light-skinned, you asked about the skin, was interesting, and I was a white boy. I was a half-breed. So discrimination doesn't discriminate. It's all over the place, and it's all about ignorance. That's why I say color of a skin doesn't make discrimination. It's the mindset that makes discrimination. And my father fought against the all-black. He said, listen, we fought against segregation. We can't be segregationists. So it can't be all black, it can't be all white, it has to be all American. And so we're still fighting that same battle right now today, though, uh, and I won't speak of politics, but I will speak of President Obama. President Obama was one president, I have to say, that represented all the people. He was not a black president, he wasn't a white president, and he made sure he stayed there. A lot of black people were disappointed with him because they thought that he should favor blacks and we should clean everything up and everything should be pro-black, this and that. It shouldn't be either way. But at least I have to say that about him, that he had a tough battle, he had no, no support, and he still kept his, his target and he still moved forward with it. So my father would be very proud to know he wasn't alive when Obama became president, uh, but a lot of people have been asked this question, and I know you didn't ask me that, but I want to put this on this camera, is that my father would not have been surprised that America selects an African-American president. He would have not because he knew it was just a matter of time. He fought impossible things. The Tuskegee Airmen don't know how much my father and family have suffered for the Tuskegee Airmen, but it's not about telling the suffering, it's about the results that you get from the suffering. And my father showed that sometimes you have to be the one that sheds the blood, but all the rest will be fine. And it's almost like a religious thing where Jesus dies for us as he does. I wouldn't compare my father to Jesus, but I would say that God has taught us the right things to do, and people have to be compassionate about that. Where did you live in Highland Park? 
I lived right in the center of Highland Park. So Highland Park is an interesting city. Highland Park is two and a half miles square. It's in the center of Detroit. At one time, there were more millionaires in Highland Park than anywhere in the United States because the Plymouth family grew up there, the Chevrolet family grew up there, the Ford family grew up there. So we lived in a four-story home. Uh, it was a colonial home. Uh, and it had a butler's quarters up on the on the on the third floor where I stayed, and had the little buttons that said master bedroom. And whenever whenever the uh, people in charge of the house would would serve would would request their servants, they would just push the button and they would come to whatever area they were coming to. And my father was an antique uh, collector along with my mother, so all of our home is antique, all Persian rugs, all all Victorian furniture. Uh, we couldn't sit on the furniture we were growing up, of course, but now that we're older, we're like, wow, that's some beautiful stuff up under all those white sheets. And so uh, so my father was really involved in getting everything back, the brass things in there. Uh, he collected uh, old telephones, the wind-up telephones, the German telephones, anything antique, including steam engines and Model A. So my father left me a 1930 Model A, uh, left me a 1959 Mercedes, uh, and then I collect cars myself. And so, but he left those two cars with me. Uh, one of the students at San Bernardino High School kept bugging him. He had a four-door, uh, it was a 19, uh, it was a 1932, uh, and it was a four-door coupe. And uh, the young man said, Mr. Spencer, can I buy the car? And he said, no, you're just going to chop it up and put some hot motor in it. <laughs> and he said, I promise I won't. And this young man has not. The young man has restored the car back. And now that many years have passed, I, I saw him, Danny Castillo, in San Bernardino. And he said, Chauncey, he said, you know, your father was right, but back then we didn't know that. But you know, this car is worth 10 times what it would have been as a hot rod. I said, it would only have been worth a hot rod to somebody that's a hot rod. But to a collector, it's always going to be an increase in value. Yeah. <laughs> um. Did you uh, follow the uh, Tigers and Lions, uh, the, the teams in Detroit when you were growing up? I did. I tried to. I was actually a Rams fan because I came from oh, California. Okay. So I had the little Rams uniform back in the day. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Lions, uh, since I've been a little older, I try to support them because I'm hometown. Uh, they disappoint me. Sometimes I'm more superstitious. And when I don't watch the game, the Lions win. <laughs> the Lions beat some of the best teams and lose to some of the worst teams. Uh, the Tigers are a little different. They're a little more constant on their on their winning. Yeah. But the Lions, they're an interesting. Group. Yeah, I I grew up in Southern Indiana, Evansville, and okay. I was a Cardinal fan. You know, yeah, National League fan. But I remember it when I was a kid, and I got to think, guess I I should probably like some team in the American League. Yeah, but there were only eight teams in each league in those days. Right. So I was thinking, hmm, Detroit Tigers. David Thompson, DT. Yeah. So, I, so yeah. I've always followed the Tigers. That's good. I remember Al Kaline and those guys, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, they were, they were fun, yeah. Well, that was a great sports town. Probably, it still is. And, it's, and it's the still. Pistons from time to time have been very They, they were, you know, when they won, we won back to back five times. So when we had uh, Isaiah, Isaiah and Duar and uh, all those guys, uh, it was a share between the Lakers and the Chicago Bulls. And the Detroit Pistons, mm -hmm. and they passed that thing around. The teams are different now. Uh, I'm more into my senior mind of myself, and so I don't even know the names of some of the main players yeah, that players. I would be able to name back in the day. My yeah. son-in-law is uh, involved in sports. Uh, he's studying to be an eye surgeon, and uh, mm -hmm. he's he has his own little uh, booking going, betting, legal betting going, yeah. and so he would be a person you could sit down and talk to, and he could rattle out all these names, <laughs> and also he's a professional golfer, so he's up in Mexico golfing. Really? Uh, oh. So yeah, that's what he likes to do, but he, he can name everybody, in, and so can my daughter, because she's been around a while. Oh, yeah. Well, they have that, what is that, fantasy football. Fantasy football, like that. exactly. So, I guess you got to know everybody. To, yeah. yeah. But I don't, never gotten any of that stuff. Yeah, well, my, my, my son-in-law's best friend is Amad Bradshaw. So Ahmad Bradshaw played with the Giants and yeah. played with Indiana, too. And uh, he's won two Super Bowls. I believe he had two Super Bowls. So they went to high school together. Um, so your dad, so he was in Detroit for about 30 years or so before he passed away? No, he was or actually... even more? No, so, more so, more. So, so he passed away in Lynchburg. He passed away in the same hometown. So, okay. so, uh, so he moves to Detroit in 1970. And uh, he's dismissed from his position in 1975. It's an appointee position, so the new mayor comes in, mm -hmm. gets rid of Chauncey Spencer. Chauncey Spencer was fighting against the black, all black this and all the black that. And there was a group of militant in there that, that uh, didn't care for Chauncey Spencer. 
because Chauncey Smithson wasn't going along with their program. And so uh, his name was Jesse Miller. That was the new mayor. Bob Black was the mayor before that. And so Jesse Miller becomes the mayor, and he uh, dismisses my father from his appointed position. And so my father's mother, Ann Spencer, just dies in 75, and so he goes to secure the property in Lynchburg, Virginia, where some of the city officials said, your mother is such a legend here. It's a shame to just watch her legacy just be erased as the house deteriorates. And they talked him into staying there, uh, where they uh, created a board to uh, encourage the historical uh, department there in Virginia to consider Ann Spencer's home a national landmark. Uh, and so this is in 75, and so 1977, they uh, uh, grant uh, the national uh, location as Ann Spencer home as being a national landmark there in Lynchburg, Virginia. When at that same time, uh, Chuck Robb, who is Lady Bird Johnson's son-in-law, is running for governor. So Chuck Robb comes down to campaign and to also be there for the uh, dedication of the Ann Spencer house. Uh, and so at the same time, Linda Johnson, his wife, and Lady Bird Johnson come too. And Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, Pendleton Prize winner of poetry out of Chicago, she comes. And so it was a big deal there. Uh, later on, Lady Bird Johnson came back and supported my father with Linda Johnson. She was so amazed about Ann Spencer. I have pictures in here I can show you uh, with uh, President Johnson's Lady Bird there were letters that come from Stonewall, Texas, where she's written back and forth, Chauncey this, uh, Lady Bird that. And uh, it's been very nice to see how that is. I have to tell you something funny. I want this on the camera. So I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be the chauffeur. And so... All of us are selected. Secret Service come in. They check us all out. And so they said, Chauncey, you're going to go pick up Gwendolyn Brooks. I said, who is Gwendolyn Brooks? I want to pick up Lady Bird Johnson. <laughs> and so they said, nah, you won't be able to pick up Lady Bird Johnson. So I picked up Gwendolyn Brooks and bring her to the, bring her to the, uh, to the affair. And Gwendolyn Brooks says, uh, you are a great driver. I need a driver to drive me around in Chicago. And so I'm in my 20s then. And so I said, well... Lynchburg is sort of slow. I'd like to get back to Chicago or Detroit or something. And so later on, I decided to look her up, and she's one of the most famous poets in the world. And I'm like, wow, I mean, my Angela learned from her. And so I'm thinking to myself, here I'm worried about somebody's got a name that I know, and here I'm riding around with somebody just as great. So I wanted that to be on the camera for Willa Brooks. <laughs> that, uh, that house, when was it built? The, my grandmother's home? It was built in 1901 built by my grandfather. My grandfather, so my grandfather and his brothers were, were uh, carpenters and plumbers and electricians, mm -hmm. and they were in the real estate business. So the Spencer family on my father's side received all their monies from property. Uh, they took $8,000 because they were bought out. Uh, they were expanding 29 Freeway on Holiday Street in Lynchburg, Virginia, so they bought up all their land. They gave them $8,500. They came down to the Davison camp where they used to induct the Confederates into the Civil War. And that was all part of College Place, which is, they're all named after Cottage Hill and this and that. And so that area where the Spencers live, that was all a place where they inducted the soldiers for the Civil War. They bought all that property and they put Spencers all around there. So my grandmother says, there's so many Spencers in the deck that we're gonna have to hang some of them. <laughs> is, it, is it a two story home or? or it's a Queen Anne, I'm sorry, it's a Queen Anne. It's a three story home. Uh, with the third story, it was, it was called a dorm. Some people would call it an attic, but it's a full mm -hmm. attic. And that's where my father had a set of Lionel trains, had engineers come, and they set up a set of Lionel trains for my oldest brother, Edward. They had the big controls, the bridges. Uh, now they'd be a fortune. My father sold those trains in order to put one of my sisters through college. One of my sisters graduated from Kalamazoo uh, College there in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah. And so those trains probably costed him back in the day, maybe a thousand dollars and they were sold to Hobby Lobby for twenty seven thousand dollars put her through college. Oh. So uh, in seventy five then your family moved to Lynchburg? Is that yes. Okay. Yes. In nineteen seventy five uh, my family moves from Detroit to Lynchburg, Virginia. And you were how old then? At this time I'm twenty uh, I'm about twenty well no I'm not either. So I graduated I'm uh, I'm not about nineteen. Almost 20. Okay. Yeah. And you had uh, gone to uh, mechanics? I went to, mechanics? I didn't go to, I didn't, I stayed in Detroit. Oh, just, you stayed, you didn't yeah, move just, down there. Okay. No, just my, when they moved, it was just my mother. So my mother, before she moves, there's a lot of this I'm missing. So my mother, before she moves from 
Michigan to Virginia, she becomes the administrator of Highland Park General Hospital. My father at that time was the deputy director of community development for the city of Highland Park. And so my father's position, of course, he's removed because he's an appointee. My mother is not. And my mother stays there and they close down Highland Park General Hospital and she stays there and closes it down with the auditors. They close down that and then my mother then joins my father. Meanwhile, my two younger sisters are still in high school. Well, one of them still in junior high school. And then my, old, my brother, the, uh, Joe, my youngest brother, he's finishing his last year of high school. So he leaves Highland Park, Michigan, and uh, where he's supposed to graduate in 77. I'm sorry, graduate in 76. And he goes to Virginia where he graduates in 77. So at that time, there was just my two younger sisters, my younger brother, and my mother and father lived in Virginia. The rest of us lived across the United States. Another question, Highland Park, I mean, was it, a, was it its own city? It is. But the mayor of Detroit could, no, could tell was... what's going on. Uh, your dad was, oh, he wasn't. Well, was your dad working for the city of Highland Park? Or? Yes, he worked for the city of Highland Park. So they had separate mayors. They were, in, they were incorporated. They were separate, separate cities. Okay, so the mayor you're talking about that let him go was the mayor of Highland Park, yes. not the mayor of Detroit. Right. I see. Right, okay. right. The mayor of Detroit at that time was Coleman A. Young, who yeah. was a Tuskegee Airman. Right. He was a navigator. And the mayor of Highland Park that hired my father to come to Highland Park from San Bernardino was Bob Blackwell. Bob Blackwell loses a re-election and Jesse Miller becomes the mayor. That's when my father's removed because Bob Blackwell's appointees are all shafted out and he brings his own administration. That house in Highland Park, is that still there? That it you is. Lived in? Yeah. It is. Do you know who owns it? Or I don't. I know one time that um, I wish I would have grabbed it. Uh, they only they, it was on auction. It was on a foreclosure for seventeen thousand dollars. So I don't know. I don't know how it's looking now. I haven't been back. So I have my own home there too. I live. My home there is in Detroit on Fullerton. So I'm about three miles from where I actually grew up in Highland Park, but I own a separate home, and I've gone back and forth by there. Uh, it needs help, but the city needs help. I mean. Highland Park has suffered like Detroit has suffered uh, with poverty mm -hmm. and decay and blightness. It's, and, it's, and the city being so small, two and a half miles square, it's, high, it's hard to hide that decay and cancering in a city to where a large city you can hit and miss it, but there you can't miss it. Um, so your dad, uh, did he live the rest of his life in Lynchburg then? He did. He lived the rest of his life in Lynchburg, got involved uh, in, in uh, politics, ran for city council, uh, ran twice for city council. The first time he ran for city council, uh, Reverend Jerry Farwell supported him and gave him $10,000. And then uh, so-called African Americans in Lynchburg thought that he was being bought, so they didn't support him. And my father can't be bought, trust me. I don't care how much money he had. And so, and Farwell was, was very kind to our family and uh, very supportive of our family. Uh, and so he had turned over a new leaf. He saw some of the things that were going on in his past. He didn't want to continue to birth. And uh, because the Farwell family were bootleggers. And uh, one, one Farwell killed another Farwell. One of the uncles, Jerry Farwell's father killed this, uh, his uncle. I mean, that's the way they did it. Uh, and so my father knew all that. And my father, when he was coming up, he worked in some of those red light areas where they had prostitution and bootlegging, where you paid the federal officers by the federal officer said, get me a gal and a bottle. And my father would work in a hotel. He was a uh, bellhop uh, working his way through school and stuff. And he saw a lot of the stuff where he delivered liquor to the chief of police in Lynchburg, Virginia. So I don't know if we all want that on there, but I mean, my father lived a real life. My father says that he was no paragon. He's lived like other men, but he knows what's right and what's wrong. My wife, Diana, mentioned that she's from Roanoke. She's born in Roanoke, but uh, her family grew up up in the hills, the Blue Ridge Mountains, you know, some little town called Czech and uh, Floyd. And I've been back there, and she remembered when she was a little girl, her uncles would take her said, well, at night, said, well, you want to go ride with us? And they'd go up and had the lights out, and she didn't, couldn't, couldn't figure out what was going on. And 
went up to course to the Check stills, the stills, the stills yeah. you know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was just the way it was. Yeah. And you're right. And I'm glad you had that because that's exactly how it works. And a lot of there's still that going on there. Oh yeah. I mean, there's still people that make their own corn liquor and stuff like that. And maybe yeah. I should be on that recording. No, no, but, they did. but but it is what it is. It's no secret to to uh, how it happened. Yeah. Uh, and that's how America was built. I mean, some of America was built like I told you earlier that in order to get the money for the plane, they went to the number men. Mm -hmm. to get the money for the plane. Yeah. The Kennedys made their fortune bringing uh, over scotch. Yeah. Uh, the Onassis and so on and so forth, the ship uh, tycoons. Uh, America has a true story to be told. And I always say this, and, I'm hoping, and, and I want this to be recorded, is that America has a history story that's like no other because there's all different types of people that are in that story that make America's history. And we have the only history in any part of this world that has that kind of history. You can't get it anywhere else. There's no place like America. I mean, if you yeah, work hard and do what you're supposed to do, you'll probably make something Come out of yourself. Top. Whereas a lot of these other countries, especially in the past, uh, there were, you didn't really have a chance. I mean, you were just, uh, you know, if you weren't, you know, like in England back years ago, you know, uh, you know, if you weren't in the upper class, right, you were just going to pretty much live the, like you were, and you weren't going to you know, be able to advance yourself. Yeah. Right. I mean, Columbus's job was to get all the ones that they thought were worthless out of Europe. That's what, that was the plan, and hope that they would get lost in the sea, but they did. <laughs> so a lot of the criminal element <laughs> came over, ended up in Ellis Island, and it was something that they survived with before then. Uh, uh, not to name any groups, but I mean, the, at one time Harlem was set up for the Jews, the Jewish people. Harlem was set up for the poor, which were the Jews. And so the Jews and the Italians were there first. And then the blacks worked there as servants and this and that. And gradually they took over Harlem. And then the garment district ends up being taken over by the Jews in New York. Mm -hmm. And so it's a history of, of itself. And now if you look at it, the Jewish people uh, control most of the businesses in America at least money-wise, and, 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 the, and the people that work side-by-side side with them are mostly Italians. And it was interesting how the Italians were the enforcers and the, and the Jewish people were the accountants and how that still works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so was your dad in pretty good health up until uh, the last few years? He was. He had a stroke. He had a stroke and he's vain. So, so he has the stroke. And so my brother's there visiting. And so my brother looks at him, Michael, and Michael says, Dad, something's wrong with your face. And so he says, I feel all right. He said, well, take me to get my hair cut first. So my brother takes him to the barber shop to get his hair cut. And the barber looks at him. He said, you need to get to the hospital right away. Your father's having a stroke. And so they put him in the car and drive him to the hospital. All that time damaged his brain. All that time because of the stroke. If he would have went there, we don't know where it would have went. So he has his stroke uh, in, uh, I think it was in April or May. And uh, his, his speech is gone, his mouth is twisted, and uh, I'm still in Detroit, my brother's taking care of him. And so uh, I said, I gotta come. He said, there's nothing you can do. I said, I gotta be there. And so my brother held me off and held me back uh, until around June, and then when I came in June, I cried when I first walked in the room, when I saw my father. And they knew I was gonna do that, and that's probably why they kept me away from that. And then I stayed with my father, he died, uh, in August and I stayed there for a month and the day before he died I had to come back to Detroit because I have an automotive business in Detroit and I had to come back to work and uh, he held my hand and he said I could hear him say he said and it was in a mumble though he said get me out of here pop get me out of here pop and I said daddy I can't get you out of here he had already climbed out the bed they had already had to strap him down they had come in there he was trying to get out of the hospital and he was on the floor and so uh, so they had to strap him down and so I took the straps loose before I left. And uh, I drove home. It was a 14-hour drive from, from Lynchburg back to Detroit. And I drove home. And my wife uh, said that my sister just called uh, and my father just passed away. So, so that was sad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so now you, um, you, okay, you have an auto business? I you, did. I sold did. it. I had okay, an auto. How, how, well, and... Well, tell me a little bit about your family, uh, your wife. And okay, so my family. wife is another sad story. So my wife died of cancer uh, uh, in 2008. 
And when did you get married? In 2002. Where did you meet her? I met her in Detroit, and we get married three days after I buried my father. Oh, my God. And then I buried my wife on the same day I marry her. So I get married on uh, in 2002. We get married um, August the 24th of 2002. I bury my father August the 21st, 2002. And then my wife dies August the 17th of 2008, and a week later is the 24th. And I bury my wife on the same anniversary at the age of 53. Yeah, so anyway, but the good side of the story is that my wife is very supportive. She was an analyst for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, she helped me with my nonprofit, uh, helped me build the, uh, the encouragement of, of young African Americans and others getting involved in aviation by way of, of STEAM. And uh, she, was a, uh, she went to Juilliard. She was a ballet dancer. She was, did modern dance, and she wanted to teach culture in our neighborhoods that where culture was there, it just needed to be brought out. And so the plan was that she was going to retire from Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we were going to run two different nonprofits. I was going to run the aviation side, and she was going to run dance and adequate side. Uh, so that didn't happen, but, uh, but she supported me all the way up through all the years uh, into what I had to do. And so now I was married prior to that, so I, had a, I got divorced uh, from my first wife in 1999, and I had a child, uh, and that's Jenny, the one that you saw. Oh, and so thank you. And so uh, that didn't work out, and so we got divorced, and then I remarried. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, where did you meet? Uh, what, what was your wife's name? That her name was Hattie Denise Allen Spencer. Uh -huh. And where we did called you her meet? Candy. Candy. Where did you meet her? I, I met her through my brother. Uh, my brother used to uh, frequent a, a, a frequent water hole. And in that water hole, all the girls used to come from Blue Cross Blue Shield and visit that. And so my brother saw that I was going through some hard times. He said, you got to meet some people. And I said, I'm okay. I don't meet nobody. And so we met, and she had a tough life. She was married, and it didn't work out in Denver, Colorado, where she worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield. And it got dangerous, and they transferred her from that location to Michigan. And so she had only been there for a couple of years, and, uh, and her two daughters were grown. I only had one child, and so we met, and about a year and a half later, we got married. But before we get married, uh, she had one of her kidneys removed, and so I didn't realize the, sen the, the sensitive and the seriousness of her cancer, because she never had to have dialysis. But she never stopped smoking, and she never stopped drinking. And so uh, one, one of her checkups came up with a spot on her lung. And this was in 2008, and this was in March. And so April, it spread to her back. And so the cancer came back, and it moved up her back uh, through her lungs and into her brain. So she couldn't take chemo. She had to take radiation, uh, and she died uh, from those causes. When she had her kidney removed, was that because of cancer? It was because cancer? of cancer, but before then, they removed her appendix because they thought she had appendicitis. So they removed her appendix, and she came back home, and she was in even in more pain. And they brought her back in there, and they found out they took the wrong thing out. Yeah. Did she grow up in uh, Colorado? No, she grew up in Michigan. Okay. She grew up in Michigan. She has an interesting background. My wife grew up with people like uh, uh, Marvin Gaye, uh, 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 Smokey Robinson. She grew up in the same neighborhood with all. Anita Baker lived next door to her. Really? Yeah. So she grew up with the Motown sound. Yeah. Right. And so my wife was born in 1954. She's two years older than me. I always tell her that. <laughs> and so I said, but older women are smarter. So anyway, she gets that. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so we. Uh, she grew up in the Motown era. Uh, and I grew up in, De in San Bernardino, and I told her it's interesting. As soon as they heard I was coming to Detroit, Detroit ran Motown back to L.A. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. How did you uh, get, get your uh, auto business started? I got my auto business started by support of three Tuskegee Airmen. Three Tuskegee Airmen reached in their pocket and gave me money to start my first automotive business, which we call Spencer Automotive. Uh, Where was that? That was in Detroit. That was in Detroit on seven. Oh, yeah, okay. oh, I'm sorry, that was in Detroit on 7 Mile, uh, on, the, on the east side of Detroit. Mm -hmm. And one of those, uh, well, two of those people, Mr. Robinson uh, was one of the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, and he was also in the great train robbery when they, when they stopped the train and got those, those auxiliary tanks. He was part of that group. 
uh, and then Coleman Young, the mayor of Detroit, was one of the other ones uh, that gave me the money uh, to get started. And they told me, as long as I'm successful, I don't pay it back. And I became successful. I worked on most of all of the Tuskegee Airmen cars. Most of them had classic cars in Detroit. There was a lot of them in Detroit. And so I worked on all of them. Um, and then I ended up getting in as a minority vendor, and I ended up getting a contract with the DEA and the ATF. I had a law enforcement background out of Ohio, working with the state police, so I had clearances. And so my best friend, Morris Cotton, ended up being the chief of police in Highland Park that wrestled with me in high, in high school. And so we continued to stay in touch. He ended up with a master's degree in criminal science and became the, the chief of police in Highland Park. And uh, he was the one that could offer me different contracts to do preventive maintenance on the police cars. <laughs> and so I serviced all the police cars. And once I got the police cars done, then I qualified to apply for the state. So I got the state of Michigan, and then I went from there to the federal, and I went to the DA and ATF. Wow. Did you sell cars too? Or just I, I didn't sell any cars. I was never a car salesman, okay. even though my mother said, you should have been a car salesman slash lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> So it was just like a garage. It was a garage. It was a repair facility. Uh, so I had a, a three bay. Uh, it was a gas station. It was a standard oil gas okay. station. And I bought the property and the tanks had already been removed. It had a clearance on it. And so I took that and I opened up a repair facility. I, before then, I was working as a police mechanic for the city of Highland Park. They contracted all their jobs out and they privatized it. That took us all out of a job. I knew it was coming down the pipeline. Like I said, my best friend was the chief of police. He tuned me in on the planning commission and what was gonna get ready to go down. I went and registered as a minority vendor. I applied, I bid on the job, and I got it. You just mentioned in Ohio, you were with the- I worked with the state police in Ohio. Doing what? I was an executive officer with the state police in Ohio. I worked for the uh, deputy warden, J.T. Fraley, uh, for the Ohio, uh, the Ohio Correctional Center. What town, where were you living? I was in Columbus. In Columbus. Right okay. in the capital. Yeah, I worked right in the capital. Oh, yeah. Frank, by the way, I don't know if he, he, uh, he grew up in Columbus, Ohio yeah. State. I, didn't know. I lived right down the street. I lived right there on Woody Hayes. Boulevard. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. J. Leonard Camera Center, where I worked out of, was the rehab center <laughs> that was controlled by the state, and that's where I worked out of that office, oh, off yeah. of Chambers Road. Well, you don't have to tell him that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a small world. It really is. Uh, so now, when did you start coming to the desert? I, I came to the desert when A.J. Johnson, who's a videographer, and he knows of your museum, and uh, he's done work here, and he said, Johnson, he said, they have a beautiful museum in Palm Springs. Hmm. So at this time, I'm only at Compton, working at the airport there at Compton, building the museum side uh, for Tomorrow's Aeronautical Museum, uh, who at that time, uh, who's in control of is Robin Pedgray. So I'm working with him, getting that done. What, and when I'm, was this? No. This was uh, two years ago, so this is how I got here. Okay. So I started here, uh, came here in 2016. Well, when did you come, basically come back to California? Uh, when I first came back to California, it was in 2000, the latter part of about April of 2016. And I was living in Gardena. Okay. So I was living in Gardena, but it was just temporary. I wasn't planning on staying here. Uh, I was just going to do this program and then go back and then do others because I traveled around doing different things. And so uh, I sort of got hooked on that one. And then the weather and stuff, I mean, how can you turn down Palm Springs? I mean, how do you do that? I wake up in the morning and I'm just looking at guys everything. Yeah. So it's hard for me to ever say I'll go back to Detroit, but just to answer your question, uh, so I came here, and I'm trying to think. I visited here uh, when my son-in-law and my daughter, they have timeshares here at one of the Marriott resorts mm -hmm. uh, on Monterey. Right. And so he plays golf, like I said. And so he came here and played golf and this and that. So they started looking around. So they wanted to have a different location, so they started looking around and looked around in Palm Springs, and I came up, and I said, there's, a, there's supposed to be a museum here. And so I came and visited the museum, so that must have been about two years ago. And I visited the museum, and they showed me the Tuskegee Airmen stuff, and I said, wow, this is nice. And I said, basically, I just love the whole museum. And so uh, we looked around for houses, and we found a good deal on a house in Palm Desert on Garden Square. And so we closed on the house on the 15th and moved in. And so I've been here since the 15th of this year. Uh, and then the first thing I wanted to do, I contacted uh, uh, Foster Standback, who's a close friend of mine and a close friend of uh, Mr. Bell mm -hmm. here. And so he said, oh, you know Fred? I said, I don't know Fred. He said, I'm going to introduce you to Fred. And so I, I didn't get introduced to, uh, 
to uh, Mr. Bell by, uh, by stand back. Uh, I just decided I would come in myself and introduce myself, and I did, and he was in a meeting, and he graciously allowed me to come in his office, and I apologized because they were in the middle of a meeting, and I brought him a mug on my father, who was Chauncey Spencer, and I said, I, I don't, I don't want to interrupt anything, sir, but I wanted to let you know that Foster Stanback, you know, oh, of course I know Foster Stanback. I said, well, he wanted to introduce uh, me to you, and I just wanted to take it upon myself to introduce myself. And so he said, well, hey, go up there and see Frank and see people in the library. And that's, that's how I got started yeah. uh, here. And then they were doing a docent class. And so I was here for the docent class. And I didn't know that I was to sign up for this and that. But they told me about it. Frank told me about it. He said, well, just go down there. And so I went down there and I started showing up Monday, Tuesday. And then they said, well, you know, you have to apply. And I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, I just want to just learn, you know, more about the war plans. I know a lot about the inclusion of African Americans, uh, I could always be brushed up on that, but I'm pretty good at that. But as far as the war plans and stuff, I, I want to be more rounded. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want to volunteer here. Oh, I'm good. And I'm so good. I want to be more rounded and make the story more of an inclusive story, other than just discrimination, other than just brutal treatment, and just a story of everybody is what I'm going to try to do. So uh, the museums, I worked as consultant during the Black Wings for the Smithsonian in the 1986. And my father was still alive. I worked along with him. Mm -hmm. And then I worked and I set up Inspiring Minds, which is the inclusion of African Americans and scientists and aviation at Charles Wright African American Museum in Detroit. I have credit on that. And then I put together the Tomorrow's Aeronautical Museum in Compton, which has some issues that we won't go on that with us. But that's another story. And so from there, I chose this place. I chose this where I live at. Uh, so I want to do this. I have my father's book. It's at the, um, uh, uh, the History and Art Museum in Ontario. It's at the Chino Airport there in their gift store. It's at uh, the 49ers bookstore, uh, Cal State Long Beach. And it's at uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills in Carson. So since the time I've been here, I've been marketing and, and getting contacts. I've become more... Uh, uh, familiar with the, the Los Angeles Unified School District, Linwood School District, Compton School District, and I've become outreach going there, inviting their kids to come to the museum in Compton as field trips. So I've been doing field trips with them. I've been bringing uh, people in that want to be docents, that are students in college, and have them, have them shadow me uh, and show them how to do things in their own communities. Yeah. And so, uh, and I think that I would be good here. I think I would be especially good there in that Tuskegee Airmen area. Oh, but I don't sure. want to be just there. I want to be everywhere. I want to okay. be versatile. But I think that I would be a compliment. It just happens that I happen to be related to one of the most important Tuskegee Airmen, and I happen to be his son. And I think that that's a draw card for here. I talked with uh, the operations manager. And I'm going to, I'm not, I have to look at his card. I want to say his name is Kevin. No. I'm not sure. Okay, well, he's the one that handles the schools. He's on the pay oh, side. Oh, Greg? Greg, thank you. Oh, sure. Right. Greg. Yeah, yeah. And so I talked with Greg uh, about maybe being in on the, on the pay side. But he's, nope. So he said, I'm the only one on that. So I said, okay. I said, well, I would like to at least offer my services. Yeah. No, so sure. uh, when you have kids coming here, uh, and then I'd like to widen it to where I can bring kids that come from inner cities that have never even had the chance to leave out the city limits. Yeah. And so he said, well, Chauncey, the only problem would be on that is that the transportation. I said, we can get people to transport. We can, we can get people to transport. I, th I think it would be very, I think it would be a good thing for this museum. I know I'm not, I know I'm interviewing, but you'll just take me out of there. I'd do that. I'm sorry. No, no. Okay. No, but but I want you to know this. I want you to know that I think that there's a part missing in this museum. And I think it has something to do with diversity. In order to bring other people in here, we have to bring them in here. Oh, we have sure. to bring them in here first. And, and I'm not saying it's the museum's fault because it's not. But it's like, it's like if you never showed anybody how to play basketball, they would always play football. It's just it's another, another thing on the menu that we need to introduce. So I've been introducing kids in inner cities. I've been working in Chicago, New York, Detroit, Los Angeles. And a lot of the kids don't even know who the Tuskegee Airmen are. They, they don't know other than a movie. Uh, and I'm talking about my group of people, not any other. Other groups of people know more about our history than we know about our own history. And, that, and, and we, should, we should think about that. And I say we as me. We should think about that because it's that important for other people, but yet we don't take the time, and we need to take the time. So before I start beating up on our own people, I want to bring them into museums like this where they can be exposed to opportunities. I bet you they've never even thought about being a museum historian. 
I mean, there's jobs like that. They pay good money. Yeah. And so, and all you do is study and learn each and every day. What I've been doing is I've been learning more and more about American history by being involved in American history. That's why I can rattle off all this stuff. That's why I, people say, how can you sit back here and say, on April the 12th, 1945, Roosevelt died and Truman became president? How can you say, in 1932, Roosevelt becomes the first Democratic president that is supported by African Americans? I mean, because I kept digging and digging and digging, and I found out that there's more than what's written there. You have to go beyond the words. And then you find out that why this time makes so much sense. It's because it's the way history is driven. History is driven. And history is constantly driven the same way. It's just a matter of being knowledgeable on how you drive that history. Yeah. Thank you. Makes sense. Thank makes you. a lot of sense. <laughs> OK. Um, I don't know. I think we're maybe getting close to wrapping it up. Okay. Any parting thoughts? Yeah, I hope that, that my personal views uh, don't interfere with, the, with my father's representation is, is, is what he's done, uh, you know, in the military and outside the military uh, for America. I want you to know that my father believed in being an American first and an American only. Uh, he believed that if you want to describe him, you can describe him as a gray haired man, five foot eight uh, and a man. And that's that would be the way that he would be described. And so my father just wants people to know that you can look in the mirror and see who you are but you don't have to run around making people understand that this is who you are because that's not really what's important. It's what you do for America is what makes you important and the color of your skin has nothing to do with that. Thank you, Chauncey. Uh, if your dad was here, I'd want to thank him for uh, his service to our country thank in you, so sir. many ways. Thank you. And uh, thank you for you, what you've been doing. And thank you, Dr. We'll, I know you'll be a real asset to the museum. We're looking forward to having you here. Thank, thank you, Dr. You so Taylor. much. Okay. Thank Okay, Chauncey, tell me a little bit about uh, what we got here. Okay, so the first hat, the green hat, was my father's service hat when he was in the 8th Regiment. Uh huh. And he did his basic training uh, at Fort Custer, uh, Michigan. And the second hat okay, after... Just a second, okay. Yeah. And the... And the uh, What's the emblem? The yeah. emblem is one flag, one country, one people. Okay. America. And that... And uh, all the 8th Regiment received that okay. after the war. Oh, all right. And my father uh, was a member of the American Legion, and he was mm -hmm. a member out of San Bernardino, California, the 714. Okay. It's on the uh -huh. other side there. Yeah. And then the other part you're looking at is a DVD that was done by the Department of Transportation oh. in Roanoke, Virginia. Okay. By Darlene Richardson. Dr. Richardson has been very supportive of my father and what he's done, and uh, the Department of uh, Transportation in Virginia has done a DVD on him, and that is it. Tomorrow all the things were gone I worked for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away The following presentation of the Virginia Museum of Transportation has been funded in part by grants from the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and Public Policy and the Foundation for Roanoke Valley Catherine Fishburne Fund. Every day, millions of people board airplanes to cross political, geographical, and cultural boundaries. But not so long ago, the skies were not open to everyone. Barely 40 years after the American Civil War ended, many southern states passed laws that affected the treatment rights, and liberties of African-American citizens. 
Around 1902, the state of Virginia changed its constitution and created a segregated society. Despite the claim that segregation provided separate but equal rights for all citizens, life for Virginia's African Americans was often inconvenient, degrading, and hopeless. This was the world that Chauncey Edward Spencer was born into on November 5, 1906. Born on Pear Street in the small southern community of Lynchburg, Virginia, Chauncey Spencer descended from the Rose, Payne, and Spencer families and was the only son of Edward and Ann Spencer. Chauncey grew up in a close-knit family that included sisters Bethel, Alroy, grandparents, his father Edward, who ran the grocery store, and his mother Ann, who was a librarian at a local African-American school. Chauncey's mother, Ann Spencer, was a writer who won acclaim as one of America's gifted Harlem Renaissance poets. Recurrent visitors to Chauncey's childhood home included W.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, James Weldon Johnson, and others who sought racial equality and change in American society. During Chauncey's youth, the Spencer home was alive with hope and ideas very different from the world beyond his front door. The Wright brothers, Charles Lindbergh, and countless barnstorming pilots throughout our nation inspired many Americans with a love for flying. No race was immune to the intrigues and an infection of flight. I was down in the basement over home, and my father had set up a great thing of Lionel electric train. And I was playing with the trains down there, and I had mother, heard mother call me. And when my mother called, it was worse than a bugle sound. They tell me that you could hear my mother two blocks away when she decided to call either of us children. And I came running out to see what she said, and she pointed up in there, and that's when I saw the first plane flying over Lynchburg, going out to the airport. So the next week, my father says, how do you feel about it? He said, come on, get in the car with me. And he drove out to the airport. Uh, it wasn't Lynchburg Airport at that time. I, I can't think of the name of it. I'll come up with it. And he, we drove Preston Glen Airport. And uh, my father and I walked on in to see the uh, pilot in charge. And my father said, uh, my son wants to take uh, flying lessons. And without any question, the man hardly looked up. He said, we don't teach color to fly. As a teenager, Chauncey held a variety of jobs at home and in New York, but his dream to fly remained constant. It was Oscar de Priest, and he was the first of our group in prior to after the Civil War. And he told me about the little uh, group that was flying out there when I told him I was doing He asked my father, who is that your son? And I passed through going to the sunroom. And father said, yeah, but he's not interested in social work. He wants to fly. So he said, we've got a little young group out in Chicago. And he named them Cornelius Coffey and Earl Renfro and so forth. Send him out there. Five days later, I was on my way now meeting with Dale White as I started. As Hitler's threat to America became imminent, the United States initiated pilot training programs in order to prepare for war. In 1939, civilian pilot training programs actively recruited and trained only white citizens. In order to prove that African Americans held both the interest and ability to fly, many African American pilots across the country staged air shows or embarked on promotional flights to highlight their skills. Chauncey Spencer, Willa Brown, Cornelius Coffey, and other pilots at Chicago's Harlem Airport formed an organization whose sole purpose was to promote aviation to African Americans. This organization, called the National Airmen Association of America, was chartered in 1939. Determined that African Americans could play an important role in America's defense, the National Airmen's Association of America recognized that they needed congressional support, or divine intervention, if African Americans drafted into the military were ever to have opportunities to train or serve as pilots. In 1939, the National Airmen's Association of America collaborated with two newspapers, the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier to sponsor a long-distance flight from Chicago to Washington, D.C. to elicit awareness and to showcase the abilities of African-American pilots. Chauncey Spencer and Dale White were chosen as pilots for the flight. We had a meeting, and at this meeting it was decided I had gone out and made contacts, and Earl was supposed to take his plane, which was a three-place job, 
uh, pilot and then two places in front of the pilot, two uh, they call them. And he was gonna take his plane. But and he had pledged to take his plane. But the week before we were supposed to take off on the 9th of May, it, we had a meeting, and Dur uh, Earl and his wife had had a parting of the way. And he came to the, this meeting and said he couldn't make the flight because uh, he was in court and there was a, quite a thing, scandalous thing going on, and he just decided not. And Dale and I were supposed to go with him, and he was going to be the pilot, uh, and we were going to meet because Enoch Waters had made an arrangement through his new, through the Chicago Defender with a representative out of Chicago by the name of William Slater, and the other one's name was Everett Dirksen. Chauncey and Dale had rebuilt this uh, plane that J-59 for Earl Renfro. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, I, I'd be afraid. To, I, I'm afraid. To. Now, here we go. Where are we going to get the money? Here we decided, well, we would get here and we got $10 here and $20. And I said, oh, this is disgusting. My big mouth. I said, I'll call my father and my mother and uh, see if we can get $1,000. So I called Pop. And mother said, well, talk with your father. So I talked with Pop, and Pop said, well, okay, I'll send you out there, special delivery, and you should get it the next morning for $1,000. We gave Coffee the $1,000. That left us $500 that he paid Art Latour. That left us uh, $500. Dale and I went down, and we bought new trousers, and the coats, and togs, and goggles. He spent $100 of himself, I spent $100. Now that $700 of the $1,000 gone. We have $300 left. Lord, $300 wouldn't even fill the tank up hardly for the Lincoln page. The governor was the first one to endorse it. And he said, I'll get two congressmen to meet you into in Washington, and he named Dirksen and Slattery. We had nobody, and I want to make that clear, we had no contact prior to that to meet anybody. <coughs> we had just decided we'll fly into Washington and we'll get the, the uh, Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier. All of them had decided they'd make so much publicity on the flight in there that we were somebody would take note and, and help us. Now that's the truth. That morning was clear, crystal clear, and we took off. Now here we are taking off. We've, uh, filled, we've already filled up with gas. We're on our way to Washington. So we're flying along, and Dale had said to me, you take, you, you take it over. He took off. And after we got over, and we, were, we had reached about, well, I'd say about uh, 2,500 miles. Only thing in the airplane we had was a flight indicator and the height, height indicator. No brakes, no air, no lights or anything. I was flying along and all of a sudden my parachute and my safety belts had pinched me my back into it. Dale was in the pilot seat and the front seat, there were just two seats in the front and back. Dale was in the back seat, I was in the front and I held up both my hands. So he took it over. And thank God for that and Dale. By the time he had taken it over, I had started to adjust in my safety belt. All hell broke loose. The engine, and I could feel the engine cutting out. Dale had cut, pulled the switch on the engine. We were really about 5,000 feet then. I had been trained, as long as you are flying, you look, always look to see a safe place to land find a vacant place that you can, that's a safety measure. If I had been flying at that time, I would have started doing it, and most likely Dale would have interfered in taking it over anyway. But uh, Dale had it, and instead of doing as I had been trained, to circle around, 
and circle down till you could get a good place to find a landing strip. That's what it should be. I would have done, but Dale didn't do that. We were flying along on a level flight. Next to wing, like this. What he did, he side slipped that plane right on down, and then he got about 30 feet, between 30 and 40 feet. He just straightened it out, and then it shipped us pancake right down. And it was right behind the farmer's barn. So I was the first one out of the plane. And then I saw the, this long red barn door open, <coughs> and I said, I, I'm sorry, sir, we had got a flight troubles here, and uh, we won't see what, he said, don't worry, don't worry, you're in a good old German neighborhood. His name was Miller, Mr. Miller. He said, anything we can do, we'll help you in any way we can. So uh, Dale was out there, and so we took the canopy down and looked, and we found out that the piston rod had broken in the plane, and that's what caused all the problem. And we were going up to beat the congressman, mm -hmm. uh, Slattery and and Everett Dirksen. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, here's where the shock came. They had arranged their office to meeting us to get publicity because their election was coming up in May. By the way, they were having a meeting, aviation meeting, down on the first floor. And uh, Edgar Brown said, we'll go down and see. Somebody's got to listen to us. And uh, Mother had, had told me that Edgar was a hothead. So we had got steps coming on down to the first floor. And just as we got down to the first landing, this man said, oh, hello, Edgar, how are you? And he said, fine, Senator, fine, all right, fine. He said, who are your friends? These are these two young men. And Big Mouth Me comes in again. I said, we trying, <laughs> we trying to get into the Air Corps. He said, well, why don't you join? And then they all uh, spoke up and said, uh, we try, we can't get in, it's uh, restricted for whites only. He said, are you citizens of the United States? And we said, yes. And he said, do you vote? And we said, yes. He said, uh, where's your airplane? And we told him, he said, how about me meeting, coming out there and taking a look at it at uh, three o'clock? Well, we didn't know that at that time, we didn't know his name was Harry Truman. So he's a mm -hmm. senator from Missouri. Mm -hmm. So uh, he looked at that. We got up there, and he was there, and, but he had four men with him, and they were administrators from his office. And he said, is that the plane you all flew from Chicago? And I said, yes, sir, that's it. I said, uh, would you like to take a flight? He said, no, but if you got guts enough to fly that thing from there, from Chicago to here, I got guts to see that you do get into the Air Corps, and he did. That accidental yet fateful meeting between Chauncey Spencer, Dale White, and Missouri Senator Harry Truman led Truman to support racial integration of the U.S. military. In 1941, two years after the Spencer White flight and the fateful meeting with Harry Truman, Executive Order 8802 was passed into law. Executive Order 8802 provided the necessary legal framework for civil rights and opportunities in the U.S. military. Pilot training programs for African Americans were finally initiated in 1941 at Tuskegee and other locations across the country. By this time, Chauncey Spencer had surpassed the age limit to serve as a pilot in the Army Air Force, However, he served in a civilian capacity and monitored race relations, the implementation of Executive Order 8802 at Tuskegee and Wright Air Force Base. No matter what position he held, Chauncey advocated civil rights for all Americans. Nearly half a century after he left Virginia to pursue his dream of flying, Chauncey Spencer returned with his family to live in Lynchburg, Virginia. In 1974, his mother, Ann Spencer, passed away, and through Chauncey's perseverance, his mother's home and garden, his birthplace, was placed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1976. Only in recent years has Chauncey Spencer, the Spencer White Flight, Dale White, Cornelius Coffey, Willa Brown, and other African Americans and their endeavors been acknowledged or recognized for their roles and significance to American aviation history. Since 1982, Chauncey Spencer has received recognition from the National Air and Space Museum, the United States Air Force, and many others.
1983, he was inducted to the Virginia Aviation Hall of Fame. On February 8, 2001, nearly 70 years after he first left Virginia in pursuit of his dream, Chauncey Spencer finally received official recognition from his home state of Virginia. And at the age of 94, he was honored on the floor of the state senate and was awarded a special proclamation from the Commonwealth of Virginia that recognized his role and significance to American aviation history. The Spencer White flight was not the earliest long distance flight involving African American pilots. However, that fateful journey of Chauncey Spencer and Dale White directly led to historic changes that impacted all Americans who dared dream to fly. Chauncey Spencer, pilot, poet, civil rights advocate, family man, Virginia's son, and true American. Prayer for Brotherhood, 1953, Chauncey E. Spencer. Almighty God, some of us are confused. You have said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, I come. It's been nearly two hundred years since men who wanted to be free fought for and died for American democracy. Nearly one hundred years ago our fathers were freed, a freedom that wasn't free. Lord, you saw the horrors of the Chicago, Washington, and St. Louis riots. You've heard all the abuse and have seen all of the intimidation directed against some of your people throughout the world. Lord, we know that the hate technique is used to confuse the real issue, used to blame national and international ills on innocent scapegoats and to gain followers through a common hate. Hate them for their color, their nationality, their religion, their politics, for any reason or not. Just hate them. Hate means power to those who are ruthless for selfish motives. Lord... We are so ashamed. Some of our people are guilty of joining these techniques against democracy. Smite them not, dear God. They are our brothers, and we are our brothers' keepers. Help us to nurture them into a great realm of truth, understanding, and brotherly love. Lord, I come now because they came to me. Freedom is shadowed. The democracies of the world are threatened. Trouble lurks. Equality, unity, and freedom are foremost in great minds. Yet there are those who maintain concerted efforts to keep some brothers bowed down into fear, as in the assault law decision of the Yanceyville, North Carolina court, the bombing of the home of the late Harry T. Moore family, Mims, Florida, and the current attempt to keep some children conditioned as inferior Americans by maintaining segregated school systems. Lord, what shall we do? Yes, Lord, I know there were no lynchings in the United States during 1952. There is integration with our armed forces. Americans in increasing numbers are being employed on the basis of merit and qualifications within industrial and defense programs. And too, Lord, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand will stand and will support democracy throughout the world. We always have. We only beg of thee, dear God, that you stand with us and lead all of us as American citizens of equal rights with no exceptions. Strengthen us as stalwart Americans in unity through our churches, whatever our choice may be, and to support the United Nations in establishing there are no superior or inferior peoples anywhere in the world, and there can be and will be equality, peace, happiness, unity, and security among all mankind on this earth in the preservation of human rights, regardless of race, creed, color, or nationality. Amen.